So let's just dive right in. Um, I thought that I would just make a few introductory remarks and then we would do the first of two exercises for you all to uh, interact with each other and engage um, based on the NEIS principles of good practice uh, for governance. And um, the second exercise will involve some powerful questions. I'll have some closing thoughts about governance uh, before we open it up um, before the end of the hour for um, for further um, discussion. Um, I know that George sent you the PowerPoint ahead of time. Um, if there's any aspect of it you need me to follow up uh, with you on, um, I'm happy, happy to do that as well. So um, when I was at NEIS and even in my role as Executive Director of AISGW for a couple of years, uh, we were very strong devotees of Dick Chait. You likely have heard of Dick. Uh, or you've read his material. And just as a refresher, um, Dick talks about three levels of leadership, the fiduciary, the strategic, and the generative. And um, in addition to what you see in parentheses for each of these levels, Dick goes one step further in sharing that the three levels of leadership um, involve what the board does as a control mechanism, what he calls doing the right things, the strategic part is the oversight board or the oversight function of the of the board, and the generative, which is the visionary insight. Um, I know that when I when I've worked with boards and when I've served on boards, we have a tendency to spend a lot of time on level one, maybe some time on level two, but not nearly as much time as we should be spending on on level three. Also, as a, oh, just as here's a picture of Dick, and I love this quote of him, the antidote to micromanagement, which heads of school that are part of our uh, audience this afternoon and assistant heads um, are, are, are always concerned about when it comes to their relationship with trustees. Um, Dick has an antidote for the micromanagement uh, um, possibility, and that, that, he says, is macro engagement. So when I work with trustees um, and, and I do board retreats, we spend a lot of time focusing in on the importance of respect in the board trustee relationship, that good communication is key, um, that it be orderly, that it be open, and it be sensitive to the needs of others so that you don't have what you see in the graphic or in the image here of a failure to communicate. And then finally, that there's candor, in the relationship and there's transparency in the relationship. So just a few little opening thoughts before we do a dive into uh, the first exercise. Dean, could I jump in? Please. Um, it, this is Patricia and I just, uh, I, I'm, I came in a couple minutes late. Do we have access to these slides and will we following this? I think maybe, maybe uh, George said something about that, but I missed it. Sure, George, do you wanna go ahead and repeat that? Sure, yes. Uh, Patricia, we, uh, yes, we sent those ahead of time and we will make those available afterward as well as a recording of this. So okay. either the Super. Thank slides you. or the recording. You're welcome. All right. Thank you. Yeah, sure. And anybody, please feel free to, to jump in. Again, the beauty of this platform is that you can do exactly what Patricia just did. Um, you don't have to necessarily push a button or, you know, you can just, just, just chime right on in. They're, they're not, they're, there's a good number of us that are involved in this webinar, but not so many that you can't just chime in when you need to. So um, for those of you that are NEIS member schools, you know that NEIS as a national association does not accredit individual schools. So the best that the NEIS board can offer is its best thinking. Um, and there are about, about 16 sets of what they call principles of good practice, or what we always call the PGPs. And we use a lot of acronyms at NEIS because we are NEIS in Washington, D.C. And so full of acronyms. But the principles of good practice are, our, are, are the board's best thinking um, when it comes to um, various roles and various duties of an independent school. There's a set of PGPs uh, for athletics and equity and justice, which I was intimately involved in uh, during my 13 years at NEIS um, and, and other aspects and other roles. And so we're going to take a look at um, and study your school's um, response to the, in, the PGPs as it, as it relates to boards of trustees. This is the preamble to um, that set of, of PGPs. Take a, take a read real quick.
So within this preamble, what are the uh, touch points for you, um, whether you're a trustee, whether you're a head of school or assistant head or associate head, what within this, um, this preamble really resonates with you as it relates to governance? This is kind of an interactive thing. <laughs> I see a couple of you have your microphones on mute. If you do, in fact, want to respond, you'll have to make sure you take your phones off mute. No responses? No problem. Let's go ahead and do a deep, no, sorry, go ahead. All right, George, I thought I, someone was about to respond, but I-, I Yeah, I did too. Maybe they're not on, maybe they're on mute. Mm-hmm. Now. I'll repeat the reminder that if, if in fact, um, if at any time you wish to contribute and we're about to go into the interactive phase of the webinar, make sure that your phone is off mute so that we can hear you. Uh, I am on an iPad in the Zoom app. There is not a microphone icon. Can anybody help me with that? Well, we can hear you fine. Right. I know. I know that. Oh, you want to be off? <laughs> if, if, if I want to be able to turn it off, I just, I don't know where that switch is. So I think if you slide to the left, that there's a, a control panel. Oh, you annotated, but I think if you are able to slide the screen over, you can. Okay. Oh, I, okay. It just appeared on the top. Thank you. Yep. And that slide just appeared on my screen too, for some reason, that the red line. I know. I, I, there's probably an eraser somewhere. Let me see if I can do that for you. Okay. If not, it's not a biggie. It, in the options section, if you hit annotate, there's a clear, which will clear everything. Right. Done. Got it. Yep. Okay, so while that's going on, we're going to move on. And um, the exercise, the first exercise that I propose that we, uh, we use for engagement is um, a set of questions that actually come from organizational development. These are called reconstructing questions. So when an organization um, has an opportunity to reflectively think about practice or about context, um, these four questions can help to generate conversation. Um, they're listed for you there, so I won't uh, repeat them, um, but I'll just say that uh, we're going to explore the principles of good practice for governance um, using these questions. Um, one more time, this is when it gets to be interactive, and if you have your phone on mute, um, uh, or your microphone on mute, please take it off so that we can um, hear you, and for those of you that are uh, visibly with us, that we can also um, see you. So this is the first principle. Um, the board adopts a clear statement of the school's mission, vision, and strategic goals, and establishes policies and plans consistent with this statement. So in your school, um, what are you doing now that you could do more of to apply this principle? What are you doing now that you could do less of to apply this principle? What aren't you doing that you should be doing to apply this principle? And what are you doing that you need to stop doing in order to apply this first principle? The floor is yours. Now, it wasn't meant to be a rhetorical conversation here. It was meant to be <laughs> interactive. That's, that's how we set this thing up. The, the, the deafening silence is, is concerning me. With this, you could kick it off. Gene, I'm here with my, with my, um, trustee with a trustee Leanne Black who's not on camera uh -huh. and she has a comment about about diversity for example yeah I was just saying that I think you can always 
when you when you look at what can you do more of, I think, and I'll only speak for Chapin, but I'm sure it applies across the board that we can all um, always be doing more to assist with diversity, um, you know, diversity of views, diversity of enrollment, mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, not just um, ethnic diversity, but also, you know, all kinds of diversity, particularly helping, helping the middle class is something that we always talk about. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And in fact, when I do board retreats, we talk about that very thing, not only in terms of um, diversity racially and ethnically, but in, but in many manifestations with a lot of cultural identifiers. I'm preparing now to do a, um, an all-day um, presentation in Jackson, Mississippi on um, hiring and retention for diversity. Um, and this, this school in particular wants to see itself as um, um, a, a, a forward thinker um, in a part of the country that doesn't necessarily follow through with that um, way of thinking. Um, and, and they want to consider a, a wide range of backgrounds, viewpoints, um, schools of thought and when they doing, when they do their hiring of, of faculty, faculty and staff. Um, and so, yes, I agree with you that, that to have that bar, part of the board's consciousness um, is very important. Anybody else on this, on this uh, first principle? If not, we're going to move on. Jean, I just wonder if perhaps the reason that you're not getting as much feedback on this is that this is a, a place that is so basic to the role of the board that it may well be that this is not um, something that we don't think about all the time. That, that, that is definitely possible. Um, and, and perhaps it's something where the four questions that I included may be that is used in the future rather than in the very moment that we're in right now. Thank you for that. Yeah. Let's move on to um, the next uh, principle. Uh, the board reviews and maintains appropriate bylaws that conform to legal requirements, including duties of loyalty, obedience, and care. This is another example of something that could be just part of the core of what you already know. But um, in case there is discussion, um, is there something that you're doing more of, you could do less of, you aren't doing or you should be doing as it relates to principle number two? Jean, that, that issue of duties of loyalty, obedience, and care I don't know how old that is in the in the NICE principles of good practice. What what does that relate to? It relates primarily to um, uh, issues of conflict of interest and issues of confidentiality. It 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 it, it focuses on um, good trustee behavior, um, and and that the individual trustees or the full board will not act will not act in ways that are um, inconsistent with uh, with good governance. Um, this also involves that the, the, the notion or the importance of the board um, being confidential in its deliberations, but at the same time, um, there is the difference between the public and the private role of the trustees, and that the public role of, of trustees and the board is to be uh, a strong advocate for the school, a strong supporter of the head, um, while the private role of trustees could be as deliberator, um, as someone to bring in, as someone to have dissent, um, if, you know, if dissent is part of what's needed in the process. And so I think all of these are, and, and this is the NEIS um, language that has been around for, for quite a while, and, and it is part of the current um, thinking from NEIS as well uh, when it comes to loyalty, obedience, and care. Gene, this is Laura. I am um, um, so. These are great questions to ask. Uh, this would this would be a great exercise to go through with with your board. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I I think I think our board is is uh, as the head of school. I'm 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 experiencing our board is um, is someone that is a board that doesn't have. Um, you know, we don't have an in-group and an out-group. There are a lot of, um, uh, I think the committees work well together. I think when when we have board weekends, um, uh, it feels inclusive. It feels um, all voices matter. Uh, and I've been, I've, I've worked with other boards where that's, that's not the case at all. So mm -hmm. it's, um, but I think that when I'm, 
I'm a bit silent and I'm not used to being silent really because I'm just trying to understand um, how, uh, how I were to answer, I mean, how I am to answer these questions as a head versus the experience of a board member on, you know, right. on the board. Yeah, yeah. In fact, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up. I did a board retreat in California back in, um, in, in late August, and we used this very exercise. And we included uh, chart paper, uh, three in paper, and markers. And we actually broke the board down into subgroups. And they did a deep dive into a couple of these principles and then brought their, uh, their thinking back to the full board. And it was a, it was a great way to, to generate um, uh, reflective thinking and some practical ne next steps uh -huh. of the board came from that exercise. So I, I definitely recommend that you uh, adapt and adopt um, this exercise for use with your own board, either in retreat or if in fact you decide to take one of your full board meetings and have it be generative in nature rather than um, fiduciary and, and, and strategic, then this would be a, a good exercise to use. Great, thank you. Our board sure. has joined us. So Hi. Hi. Welcome. Welcome. All right. So here yeah, we're going to move on to the next principle. Uh, we still have that red line for some reason. Don't don't worry about it. Just know that it's uh, where somebody swiped. <laughs> I don't know whether it was a left swipe or wipe swipe, but there was a swipe, and that's what you're seeing on the screen. Maybe it's a drone. <laughs> <laughs> oh Lord. <laughs> Let's let's hope not, or something falling from the sky. <laughs> Here's the third principle. The board assures that the school and the board operate in compliance with applicable laws and regulations, minimizing exposure to legal action. The board creates a conflict of interest policy that is reviewed with and signed by individual trustees annually. So this is the whole risk management aspect of, of, of governance. Any reflection, anything coming up for you as you reflect on this particular principle? I think, I think probably in, in the world in which we live, this is, this is just critical for boards mm -hmm. to think about risk and litigation. And so I'm going to guess that that probably bubbles to the top very quickly around conflict of interest policies being signed early on on, the, on boards and uh, it, it seems to me that there's an imperative here that some of the others might not be have you know have so much energy behind them. Right, right, absolutely. In the world we're living right now, with the things that are happening, it is so important that the board is on board, if you will, and that trustees are on board when it comes comes to risk. This is another opportunity to think beyond just the minimum. Um, think of the ceiling rather than the floor when it comes to risk. Um, a key example of that would be the work from um, uh, the Center for Early Education in Los Angeles, California. Revita Bowers is in, is in her last year of headship there. And uh, she created a long time ago uh, what they call a, 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 a covenants. There's a board covenant, which goes beyond just conflict of interest. And it, it speaks to how trustees and the board will be in relationship with the school and with relationship with each other. And along with the conflict of interest um, um, statement that is signed every year, um, the board signs this covenant, um, this agreement with, with how to, to, to um, successfully and effectively engage with the school and with each other. And when, by the way, it's not just a board covenant. There is a covenant for parents. There's a covenant for uh, faculty and staff um, as well. And um, it's a great model and a way of, again, thinking of the ceiling and not the floor when it comes to engagement. I strongly recommend that you contact Ravita at the Center for Early Education if you'd like to know more about uh, their covenant. Sorry, about their covenants. They're, they're really great. I got, I, um, I received all of them from her um, a few months ago and they're, they're terrific. I would, I would say the same thing, Gene. Yeah, very good. All right, let's move on. Here's the fourth uh, principle. The board accepts accountability for both the financial stability of the fi uh, financial future and the financial future of the institution, engaging in strategic financial planning, assuming primary responsibility for the preservation of capital assets and endowments, 
overseeing operating budgets and participating actively in fundraising. Now, pieces of that you may already know to be part of the fiduciary work, um, but, but I'm wondering if you have comments or uh, reflections on this very last part, participating actively um, in fundraising. But if you found successful in this or other areas of this principle. My only comment might, would be that I don't think our schools are successful unless our trustees are involved in fundraising and promote, and that's, that's one active way to promote the mission of the school because the mission of the school includes vision and generative thinking and all of that. And that obviously involves projects and programs and partnerships that all have financial implications, or most have financial implications. That's right. To say nothing of competitive salary, so I, I, it's hard to imagine that a school would be, would survive, quite frankly, without mm -hmm. active engagement of, of trustees. Absolutely, I agree. I think that at, at, at our school that there's an inconsistency, though, um, uh, amongst trustees in terms of um, how actively. Uh, they are involved in fundraising and how much they feel uh, that uh, obligation. Um, so, and, and, and also just the comfort level, how they define kind of um, being helpful with fundraising and, and uh, you know, a lack of a comfort level with, uh, with fundraising. Exactly, exactly. It, it, it's very complex. I mean, I mean, a lot of it, it goes with tradition, but a lot of it goes with what's, what's policy in terms of board membership. Um, I serve on a board uh, and, and some board members are out of town that aren't, aren't in the Washington DC area. And in addition to just the general fiduciary nature of, of this principle, the active involvement and active participation is difficult when not all of your trustees are in, are in, the, in, in Washington, D.C., in, in, in my case. So it, it puts an additional burden on those of us that are in the city where the school is located to um, be even more actively involved in, than, than other trustees are who don't live in the area. Anybody else? Genius. Hi, my name is Andy Gove. I'm from Long Island Lutheran. Uh, just curious, you know, actively fundraising uh, can be defined lots of ways, you know, you know, for first part being do all board members give and mm -hmm. different levels of that. What have you seen in your work that uh, of different boards with regard to their actual involvement in fundraising, uh, whether it's asking uh, like-minded friends or, or parents or even bringing in corporate sponsors if they have it and can you help me you know our board gives but but they are not part of asking with me that's all on my advancement team and myself sure and, and and others of you please feel free to chime in i know that that the years that i've been involved in independent schools there's been a, a bit of a, a a change in focus it used to be you know a long time ago just a give or get when it comes to fundraising if you're going to be a board member um, or there's, in some cases, uh, there has been a minimal give um, to be even considered um, um, for board membership. And um, other schools are, are thinking that this could either stunt their recruitment efforts uh, because not all potential trustees can afford to give a minimum. Um, and no one has ever talked about a maximum when it comes to fundraising and board participation. But um, if, in fact, you're wanting to have a rich diversity um, of board members in a number of ways, including socioeconomic background, um, including um, um, professional expertise, um, they are rethinking um, their notion and their expectations when it comes to, to fundraising. Um, I know that when I was uh, working at NAIS and I was on the board, there was this concern that I was working for a nonprofit and that I couldn't actively fundraise for another nonprofit. And I don't know whether there are legal reasons for that or if it was just a practice. Um, but I think that the, the opportunity to, um, to think of, of fundraising and board participation holistically in such a way that there could be board members that contribute to your board um, in ways that are best for them that are not monetary. And that has as much value to, board, to the board as does 
active involvement. So that's kind of a long-winded answer to a specific question that you have, but uh, hopefully that will generate some further discussion to answer your, your question. Gene, one of the things that we've tried to do also is to educate our board on how to articulate what makes our school special, mm -hmm. so that when they are in their circles, uh, our, our school is uh, not as um, widely known, I would say. So when they're in their circles with people who might be fascinated by the mission of our particular school, we've really been working on educating them about the language to use um, that can promote uh, development efforts um, in a less direct way. Mm -hmm. That's very helpful. So a lot, of, a lot of work around particularly active participation will come in your board orientation. Um, and, and working in partnership with your advancement team um, to, to make sure that to the extent that the, the board chair or the board president can, can help shepherd the work um, and that coaching is provided um, and advice is given to, to board members. A lot of board members may be reticent. It isn't necessarily part of their expertise in their own professional, personal lives, but I think with, with coaching, with good examples, um, um, Board, more board members can be um, actively involved in fundraising. Are we getting at helping you with your question, Andrew? Yes, there's just one other aspect of it too, and that's just something I've heard at different conferences, and that's the board. Uh, you know, usually with the head of school, uh, you know, actually some members making ask to other members of 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 like ability. You know, not mm -hmm. just not just diversity of giving, but actually helping. Um, you know, I gave, uh, you know, would you be interested in giving as well? And here's right. why. And, and uh, I just haven't actually seen that in practice. I'm wondering if anybody um, has board members make asks with them for, for larger gifts. Mm -hmm. I have heard of that happening, but let's see what other participants think. Patricia, were you about to say something? Well, yeah, I, I maybe, maybe my uh, Leanne would like to speak of, of she's a, um, our trustee and head of the, the finance committee. Yeah, I was just going to say that I think it's absolutely critical, and in practice, um, we actually see it a lot. I think it's, uh, you know, somewhat of the foundation of how we are able to um, get the robust gifts that we do get. And I think every board member needs to take an active role, and it starts it starts with that individual themselves giving. Um, and you know, you can use different words to, you know, help. Um, worse <laughs> or encourage um, others to give but I think um, I think it's absolutely critical that 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 be an important part of um, the giving process particularly if you're in the middle of a, a capital campaign uh, but but even in annual giving which as we all know is so critical to the school's success each and every year yeah that's that's a great point and, and it made me think also of the importance of uh, a board recruitment in this area and not shying away from having conversations about um, active uh, board um, uh, participation in, in, in fundraising, even as you're recruiting for board members. That way it doesn't come as a shock to them when, the, when they join the board that in fact the expectation is that they would be actively involved in fundraising. Jean, I was just going to go back and make one other comment on risk management, um, which to me is just such a critical component of the success of the board and the the one thing that strikes me is that the types of risk management are shifting and I think everyone needs to um, think about um, risk management um, perhaps through a different lens whether there are issues associated with data privacy um, regulations cyber security and cyber crime whether that's funds being misappropriated or grades being misappropriated, um, but also all of the risk associated with social media. Again, uh, a lot of this being driven by technology. So, um, you know, in my mind, I've been thinking about the importance of having a board member who is extremely tech savvy on the back end and can really help us think through um, lots of these issues because the exponential um, growth in technology and the disruptors that are taking place are huge. And I, I imagine they're just going to get even more significant over the next number of years. And so 
I think it's just a whole nother pool of risk management that perhaps, um, not that we weren't focused on, but probably needs greater emphasis or focus. Right? In, indeed, I totally agree. And the other area I think of a profound need in risk management is school safety. And um, I can only imagine that um, if schools haven't done so already, um, they are spending a lot of time, energy, and resources in, in improving school safety. Let's take a look at another, uh, um, uh, uh, another principle. Um, the board selects, supports, nurtures, evaluates, and sets appropriate compensation for the head of school. We have some head of schools in our audience this afternoon, um, and I'm, uh, I'm reminded of when I was at NEIS running the Leadership Through Partnership program. We did a feature one year where we separated the heads and, and the, the trustees that were attending uh, this workshop, and uh, we focused in on um, having heads respond to what I want my trustees to know that I'm afraid to tell them. And in the, in the other room, um, trustees were saying, what I want my head of school to know, but we're afraid to tell him or her. So um, this may be an area of a, of a bit of sensitivity um, in our discussion today, but let's go for it and see if there are uh, any, any responses to the four questions that you see on your screen as it relates to principle number five. We, we have an annual uh, evaluation that the board participates in and every other year it's an evaluation of the head and the sec and the off year it's the evaluation of the board itself mm -hmm. and so that we don't I, I don't think there are many secrets and there's a great it's online it's through board source so I recommend mm -hmm. that to all of you and I know uh, our our board participation Leanne is usually about a, I mean it's often a hundred percent and so it's an excellent way to and, and there's, they have the opportunity to do generative thinking back to, gen, I know, back or back, or I know you're going to talk about more generative thinking later on in the seminar, but mm -hmm. uh, that's, that's to, to have it as a regular thing and not as an occasional thing and that everyone comes to expect it every May, that there will be this survey and thoughtful feedback about it in the fall and continued conversation as needed has been, has been a really uh, strong aspect of our board head relationship yeah and the key to what you're saying is no surprises right one way or the other no surprises anybody else all right we're gonna go on here is uh principle number six the board recognizes that its primary work and focus um that should be is or are, that's right, are long range and strategic. This goes back to what I said at the beginning, even in my own um, board work experience, we, we spend, we, we get so far um, into dealing with the budget and supporting the head of school and, and you know, we're, we're in a capital campaign right now as well, um, that we uh, often neglect or forget about uh, the long range and the strategic nature um, of our work. What are you finding successful um, in, in your schools um, in, in striking a balance between the short term, the putting out the fires, the supporting the head, and the long term and the strategic? Um, well, uh, but our, our structure is uh, the structure of our board is, is about 50% um, parents. In my trustee, so get here, her right. Helps yeah. a lot in terms of. Um, uh, I think the alumni trustees are naturally uh, very uh, long range oriented um, in terms of mindset, uh, and and the parent trustees. You know, parent trustees. It's always difficult to balance that role as a parent, right. and that role as a as a trustee. So, um, uh, so. I, that's that's been very helpful for us and it has developed into a really uh, uh, very respectful and um, uh, uh, you know very respectful working relationship amongst parent and alumni trustees on our board. Laura we couldn't hear you at the very beginning but it got better as you were speaking. Um, we want to make sure that that we heard all of it. Uh, would you mind if you can remember what you said? Can you? That, that was Tracy, uh, my board oh, chair. 
Yeah. Sorry, sorry. That's no, okay. Sorry. Uh, it's Tracy Lempe, uh, the board chair uh, at Masters. And we, um, we deliberately uh, keep a, a approximately 50-50 balance um, on our board between parents and alums. Uh, so um, uh, specifically to address this issue, to, to stay very long range focused and, mm -hmm. and uh, strategic and recognizing that you know, that alumni trustees bring a naturally long-term perspective to the board table, uh, whereas parent trustees um, might struggle with that a little bit. On the other hand, parent trustees are much more in touch with what the school is today mm -hmm. uh, than the alumni trustees. So it's developed into a, a, a really nice balance and very um, uh, collaborative and um, respectful uh, group, I think. It's a good approach. It's a good approach. Anybody else? Um, I was going to say it um, at my school. We our regular monthly meetings are more about the day to day, um, what's going on with the school. But at the end of the year, we always have a um, retreat where we focus on long range um, uh, issues that we don't have time to get into in depth in the regular monthly board meetings, and that works out well. Mm -hmm. And do you take more time for the retreat? Is it like a full day away yeah. from campus? Yes, and there's often a facilitator, not always, but mm -hmm. it's, um, a full day or a half day away from campus. Um, and um, you know, we look, look at things in much more depth and break out into groups and, and um, uh, that's been worked out well for us. Mm -hmm. Good, great. I would say that we also do that to a certain extent at the committee level, Jean, mm -hmm. um, so that um, in each of those areas, we're looking forward even as we're dealing with the day-to-day. -day. Yeah, and I would say this is an, an opportunity when it comes to board recruitment. Um, I know a lot of, of boards and governance committees are testing out potential trustees. By Put them on um, committees and on board members. And this is a way of orienting board members to the importance of long range and strategic thinking, um, even as you're uh, recruiting. We actually run a one year, a five year, and a 10 year uh, plan. We run a rolling one year with a mid year, a middle, you know, five year plan and 10 year, and we adjust as we go through. But, uh, you know, like when the iPads came up, I'm sure everybody's five-year plan changed. <laughs> so, so we always have the rolling one year, and we do have a committee structure that allows us to test people, you know, out. Uh, and within the committees, we're always working on the one year, the five year, and the ten year. We're trying to make them, and the ten year is only four aspects all the time. We always break it down into four goals. Uh, the five year is more of a where do we want to be after the rolling strategic plan works, uh, and the one year is our accountability structure. It's been, it's been something that's been really fun and very fluent with regard to giving board members a, a clear ability to, to think long term, uh, but also make sure we're doing the day to day. Yep. Gene and everyone, sorry, but we have to sign off at Masters. Sorry about that. No problem. Take care. Thank you for Thank participating. You. All right. All right. So what I'm going to do, I'm noticing that we have about 15 minutes left, and I'm going to go ahead and just just introduce the other um, principals. Um, George, do we? How many participants do we still have with us? Or Andy? Oh, yeah, eight. It looks like eight. Yeah. Oh, okay. Cool. So we can still move forward. So let's go on. The next principle: uh, the board undertakes formal strategic planning on a periodic basis. Sets annual goals related to the plan and conducts annual written evaluations for the school, the head of school, and the board itself. I think we've kind of already covered this one um, in, in previous conversation. Um, is there any insight um, that anyone wants to add before we move on to finishing up this exercise? Just that we have committee uh, goal each year, all of our committees submit goals, which mm -hmm. really serve to then guide the work of our of, of the of the subgroups. Right. Now, do you have non-board members on your committees as well, or are they all board members? No, we have some, some non-board members, depending mm -hmm. on if we're looking for a particular le uh, level of expertise. Right, right. I see. Good. And do the non-board members participate in the goal setting as well? Uh, they, 
Well, they're presented with the goal, so I would oh. assume that if they, yeah, they, mm -hmm. there's no kind of there's no distinction really in the in the committee meetings. Sure, sure, that makes sense. In our in our case, the goals are, are largely set by the um, committee chairs in conjunction with the governance chair mm -hmm. and and the chair of the board. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Very good. All right, here's the eighth committee. Uh, the board keeps full and accurate records of its meetings, committees, and policies and communicates its decisions widely while keeping its deliberations confidential. It's not a policy unless it's written down. Um, and part of this is uh, the Sarbanes-Oxley uh, requirements that you have accurate minutes, that you, um, you know, make those available when asked and, th and that kind of thing. But is there anything you're doing now that you could do more of, less of, aren't doing or should be doing when it comes to record keeping? This is, this is somewhat of a perfunctory one, but it is a principle, so I thought I would introduce it. I think George uh, just checked our vault to make sure we were accurate a year ago. So. <laughs> You're there, right, George? That's yeah. right. These are all, that's something I was going to mention at the end, but this might be as good a time as any, that uh, while NAIS does not accredit schools, as Jean mentioned at the beginning, NYSEIS accredits schools, and many of the NYSEIS criteria for accreditation, um, I, I think anyone familiar with that process will notice that these principles of good practice are very much embedded into that structure. So, in fact, many of these details are things that the visiting committees are, are looking at, and and we hope that schools are really looking at on a, a regular basis so that um, it's not just at the accreditation time, of course, that uh, they become important. <laughs> Good point. All right, we're about finished up with this exercise. Just a couple more. Um, this, is brought, this was brought up earlier uh, in our discussion and that's board composition. Um, that in fact, um, the board composition will reflect uh, the areas that you see there on your screen um, and the importance of a diversity of board members uh, to achieve the mission and the strategic objectives um, of the school. Um, how, how have you been successful in diversifying your board when it comes to expertise, uh, resources, uh, or perspectives, or racial, ethnic, or gender um, diversity? What have you found um, helpful and successful? Uh, we use a board profile that we evaluate um, at least annually. Um, uh, through the governance committee. Um, mm -hmm. Anybody else? I just had a governance committee meeting of a board I'm on just last week for that very purpose, and we used uh, we used a profile um, in, in very successfully, and we actually found out that there in our demographic of, of Episcopal schools, um, I'm on the Mesa board, which is the Mid Atlantic Episcopal Schools Association. Um, we we just saw. Um, just last week, an opportunity for even new uh, sources of, of background to include in our own um, uh, board recruitment efforts. All right, so the last um, couple um, deal with the, how the board works. Uh, number 10, the board works to ensure all its members are actively involved in the work of the board and its committees. So this goes beyond, Andrew, just active involvement in fundraising, but just active involvement in the life of the board and the work of the board and the work of committees. Um, this is where um, sometimes turf wars, sometimes ego wars or power wars, um, or sometimes um, you know, board members who like to be on a board but don't want to necessarily actively in, you know, be involved in the board um, could be a problem for, for the board chair and for the head of school. I know that no nicest school has that, that problem at all, um, but, but what, what, what ways are you finding helpful? What strategies are you using um, to ensure that all of your board members are actively involved in the life and work of the board as well as uh, committee work? I think one important thing is to ask your com your board members what their committee interests are. Mm -hmm. In addition to their profile, um, you don't want to put somebody on a committee that they have absolutely no interest in being on um, when they could do contribute in a major way on a different committee. Absolutely. Absolutely. 
as you said before, we run uh, committees that are largely non-board members. We have two board members on each com uh, committee, two or three. Um, typically, the the active involvement is is visible for a few years before they would join the board. And the committee that they've served on then usually is their obvious committee that they'll, they'll move on to. Very strategic, very strategic. Anybody else? All right, then a um, couple more. Um, sorry, let me go back. Um, number 11, as leaders of the school community, the board engages proactively with the head of school in cultivating and maintaining good relations with school constitu uh, constituents, as well as the broad, broader community and exhibits best practices relevant to equity and justice. Um, I should say as a former employee uh, and vice president in, in EIS, that another set of principles of good practice for equity and justice um, does now include um, three specific principles that relate directly to trustees and the head of school um, as uh, um, not only stewards of the mission, but also as stewards and active um, involvement when it comes to diversity and inclusion in the school. So there's, you know, kind of a connection between number 11 and uh, another set of principles from NEIS. Then finally, the board is committed to a program of professional development that includes annual trustee orientation, ongoing trustee education and evaluation, and board leadership succession planning. Um, I think that this last piece um, is a piece that I know the boards I'm on, we could do um, a lot more work in, and that is succession planning. Um, it's, it's, it's not something that you want to, um, to have as a posture to alarm the head uh, necessarily, but, but yeah, along with risk management, it's just so key that you have um, um, succession planning in place for a number of, of, a number of reasons. Um, any comments or reflections on this, this last principle? When you're talking here about succession planning, do you mean the um, planning for the next chair of the board or planning for the next head of school? Yes, it, it, says, it says board leadership succession planning, but in addition to that, there should be succession planning for the head of school as well. I think it could be awkward to discuss board leadership success, I mean, uh, discussing who's gonna be the next chair of the board because you sure. never really have a meeting without the chair present, whereas at the schools that I'm involved in, we have executive sessions where the head of school is not there so that we right. can talk about this in a way that's not, um, uncomfortable yeah I, i've never heard of somebody having a meeting without the head of the board there right right and i know that some schools have it in their by but the succession planning is actually part of their bylaws and so i know that you know if someone serves as vice chair of the board they are you know although there is a vote that takes place they're like the heir apparent to be the, the next chair of the board um some have it as a practice and not as a policy uh, but I think you're right. It definitely is it's something that's generated first from the governance committee and discussed in executive session. But with the head's involvement, I mean, the, the head needs to be involved and give advice, um, I would recommend. Anybody else? Well, being mindful of time, and it is a school day, I do want to go ahead and introduce um, some powerful questions that if we don't necessarily get into them today, uh, you, could be, you can use them with your board um, to, to have further generative discussion. And I call them powerful questions because of uh, the work of Poulos and Horth that you see on the screen. Um, often the solution to coming up with, it is to come up with powerful questions rather than to go directly to uh, solutions. So powerful questions do the three things you see there bulleted. Um, invite exploration, uh, resist easy answers, and uh, invoke strong passions. Um, so when it comes to governance and generative conversation, I adapted six powerful questions um, from the book uh, by Poulos and Horth, and um, here are the six. I'm going to pause for a moment and give you a chance to, to look at them to see um, if you want to discuss any of them.
So a lot of text, text there, not necessarily, you know, a best practice when it comes to PowerPoints, but um, do any of these powerful questions kind of make sense as a next step for, for you and your own working governance? I think number five is probably, I don't know, for me, with all the new possibilities in education, you know, and, you know NICE is even working on the online consortium and, and then you have board members and teachers alike who question its effectiveness and, and whether or not it should be there, um, you know, and many, many other uh, great ideas and opportunities out there that, that a large group of people who are worrying about the financial um, aspects of the school, all the stuff we just mentioned, and then trying to find that freedom to boldly move forward. Uh, you know, so I, I love the fact that success was guaranteed. Um, you know, that would take away all the, the reasons why you couldn't do something, right? Which I'm guessing is the sole purpose. And then, therefore, you can maybe find a plan within that to, uh, to make something that's maybe a little bit more risky a possibility in the future. Sure, absolutely. Thank you. Anybody else? You know, it's interesting. There's, a, there's an article that's making its way around uh, uh, the world right now um, that asks the question, uh, not what do you want to do, but what are you worth struggling for? And mm -hmm. I think um, aside from uh, thinking of that as individuals, I think it's a really good question for schools. Um, mm -hmm. You know, what, what are, what's worth struggling for mm -hmm. as a school? Um, mm -hmm. and, and that might be, um, a question that I would uh, pose as a question for a board. That's great. That that makes that that's a, that I like that question a lot. What's worth the struggle? And looking Anybody at the time, that oops, sorry, Gene, I didn't mean to cut you off. That's all right. Go ahead. I was going to say, looking at the time, that may be a wonderful point on which to end. I'm sure, Gene, you may have a, a few thoughts you wanted to end with. Um, but I wanted to be mindful of everyone's time as we approach the five o'clock hour. Mm -hmm. So I would just, just a couple of points that I wrote down after um, looking at the NAIS trustee handbook one more time, although I've you know, studied it for a couple of years. Um, this notion of good trusteeship being like um, driving that in fact, you know, when you're driving well, you spend a little bit of time looking in the rearview mirror, making sure that uh, what you've gone through, that there's nothing behind you that could be a, 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 an impediment to your, your current driving conditions. You also look down at your uh, indicators, making sure that you're going at the right speed and that your engine is running smoothly and you spend time looking ahead to make sure that there, there are no obstacles or there are in fact, our opportunities in your driving um, moving forward. And um, I think that an opportunity for um, um, ongoing generative work um, to, to have trustees and the board be champions and advocates for the school is, um, is something that um, is very important. And I wish you all well in your leadership, uh, whether you are a head of school uh, or a school leader. And if there's any way that I can be helpful to you, um, please let me know. Uh, my information is available um, on the PowerPoint. Thanks, Gene. My pleasure. Wonderful. Thank you, Gene, Thank so you, much Gene. For, your, you, Gene. for your wisdom today and, and for all of your guidance in the conversation. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning, we will send a recording of this PowerPoint to all of the participants, as well as your contact information with the um, uh, with with uh, with all of that. So thank everyone. Uh, thank you, everyone, for your participation, and have a lovely week. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye -bye. Thank you. Bye.